Hello, everyone, and welcome to our bonus edition of World's True Crime. I'm Brad, and with me is my beautiful fiance, Denise. Hello again, everyone. Hello. Hello, everyone. <laughs> I try to be different. Hello, everyone. Hello. <laughs> well, it's like Julia Child. We're doing a cooking one here. Oh, okay. Is it? <laughs> yeah. I know nothing about this case. She did this one all on her own, and I've never heard of this one before in my life. I did. <laughs> it's a bad Julia Child. <laughs> So on this trip, I wanted to go to Italy. Okay. Because we haven't done it yet. Well, eventually we will, but we haven't done it yet. So are you picturing a short, heavier woman who is by the stove cooking up a big pot of spaghetti? Pretty much, yep. <laughs> Sounds good. We had spaghetti last night. We did. <laughs> I had to think about it. But it sounds good, right? It does sound good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But you're not going to want it from her. Oh, no? <laughs> no. You will not. Not when you find out what she cooks up. I'm starting to feel like this is going to be cannibalism. Mm, could be that. Okay. I don't know anything about this case, so I have no idea. I'm kind of guessing as we go. Okay. So today we're talking about Leonardo Cincilli. The Cin soap. Cincilli. Cincilli. The soap maker of Correggio. Okay, sounds like some nice words to say. I'm not going to keep saying those. Okay, Le like Leonardo. Leonardo, yeah. So, Leonardo Cincilli, her mother, Emilia Di Nolfa, was forced to marry her rapist, Mariano Cincilli, after her pregnancy was discovered. From the rape, a girl, Leonardo Cincilli, was born on April 18th, 1893, in Mont Montella di Alvino, in a commune municipality in the province of Avellino, Campania. Very fancy sounding. This is very fancy sounding. Yeah. So I'm just going to put a disclosure right now. We might get a few of these words wrong. We will. But she has an interesting story, so I wanted to get yep. into it. Oh, 100%. And they're not all going to be easy. No. Definitely not going to be easy. We're especially when we're bouncing around the world. Yeah, we're doing our best. We are. So being created through crime of rape, Leonardo was already marked by an unhappy childhood. She knew where she came from. She knew that her mother was raped and she was the, um, the, the product, of, the it, product yeah. of it. Yeah, exactly. Yep. So she grew up miserable and isolated in the poverty stricken parts of Italy. Yeah, there probably wasn't all the wealth back then. Well, we're talking about the late 1800s, right? Yeah. And a lot of those Italians, I know, came near the late 1800s towards New York City in search of a better life. A lot of mm -hmm. like, the gangsters and stuff, right? They all came from Italy. That's very true. The Banca Romana scandal surfaced in January 1893 in Italy over the bankruptcy of the Banca Romana, one of the six national banks authorized at the time to issue currency. The scandal was the first of many Italian corruption scandals and discredited both ministers and parliamentarians. Parliamentarians? Parliamentarians. Parliamentarians. I was not even close. <laughs> in particular, <laughs> in particular, those of the historical left was comparable to the Panama Canal scandal and was shaking France at the time, threatening the constitutional order. A lot of fancy stuff. There was a lot of fancy stuff. I don't know much about the Panama Canal scandal, but... Neither uh, do I. Apparently, it's something. Yeah. But the, that's not our case today. No, it's not. The crisis prompted a new banking law, tarnished the prestige of the Prime Ministers Francesco Crispi and Giovanni Gioletti. And, that sounds about right. Uh, thank you. And prompted the collapse of the latter's government in November the same year. When Leonardo was very young, she lost her father trying to help the financial situation. It wasn't long before her mother remarried. So it was probably a good situation that he, she lost him because he was a rapist, at that, you know. Well, yeah, exactly. It was a good thing for her. It would be because as a rapist, you don't know what he could have done to her later on. Mm -hmm. But looking at Leonardo, all you see is the rapist. That's right. Unfortunately, her getting remarried did not help. Leonardo was emotionally abused by her mother and the least loved of the five siblings. I believe... It's because she was conceived through rape and seeing her daughter only reminded her of, like I said, Mariano Cincilli. 
or it's because she was forced to marry this guy. So she was forced out of living a better life. That's the life she had to live. And she didn't have any options of marrying anyone else. Yeah, exactly. So either way, I want to say either way, it was not Leonardo's fault that she was born in such a disturbing way. But I am astounded that the mother was forced to marry her rapist. Like, that doesn't happen now. No, but that's this is the eight, late 1800s. Mm-hmm. Things are different than, like, even being, having a child before marriage was considered a sin. It was, so. yes. Or living with somebody even before marriage. Or holding hands. You had to have a chaperone. Yeah, exactly. I personally think that Leonardo's mother probably also felt unloved being stuck in that situation well yeah she had to force to marry her rapist Mm -hmm. so that that wouldn't make you anybody feel unloved yeah so it's things very toxic it was very toxic that's just the way of life back then though it's a whole lot different than it is now thank goodness yes now i don't understand why parents would treat their children badly just because they were treated horribly i myself would want my child to have better than i did yeah but also this is a different time you got to put that in perspective as well. Yeah, it's hard to put it that in perspective because I wasn't there. All I could think about is now my child is my everything. Yeah, this always reminds me of that picture I always see when that mother put, uh, she had that sign saying four children for sale <gasps> in like New York. You ever really? See that? You ever see that picture? No. That was on Facebook. It was like, um, it happened in the early 1900s. She actually put a sign saying four children for sale. And then she was like walking away and she was like holding her head down, like, trying to hide it. Wow. I do believe that she sold them as well. Wow. Yeah. So this is that that's a different time back then. I'm glad I'm not in that time. Yeah, exactly. Leonardo's mother, Amelia, was extremely abusive towards Leonardo that she attempted suicide twice as a child. A quote from her memoir, an embittered soul's confession. I actually love the name because it suits her so well. How could she not feel bitter after what she's gone through? Yeah, she was dealt a bad hat right from the get-go. She has. She quoted saying, I tried twice to hang myself. Once they came in to save me, and the other, the rope broke. Mom let me know that she was sorry to see me alive again. Once I swallowed two sticks of his torso, always with the intention of dying, and ate some shards of glass. Nothing happened. Her mother actually said to her that after she tried to commit suicide the first time, Leonardo either commits suicide successfully or don't bother at all. When she was young, she went to see a gypsy or a fortune teller who predicted Leonardo's future. Gypsies have been in Italy since the 15th century. I did not know that. I knew knew about gypsies. I knew that they were older, but I didn't know how long. Did you know that the gypsies originated in the Punjab region of India? Nope, not a clue. That's I'd, one place I've never thought that they'd come from. No, neither have I. I. I've seen some gypsies on TV and stuff, but I never put those two together. Thinner. The movie Thinner. Thinner? Yeah, the movie Thinner. The Stephen King movie. He eats the pie when he gets all thin because he killed the, oh, yeah. he killed the yeah. gypsy yeah. grandfather. Yeah. So she put a curse on him. And then he started getting thinner and thinner. And then he had that pie at the end and he, mm-hmm. gave, and he was giving it to his wife because she was cheating on him. Mm-hmm. And his daughter ended up eating it as well. Mm-hmm. So I think he ate it. Something like that. I don't remember really. I don't want to watch that now. It's a good movie. Yeah. But that had that. It was all the gypsies in that one. Yeah. Okay. We should add that to our list of movies to watch. Well, I've watched it. I just forgot the ending. Well, I want to see it. Yeah. And you can watch a movie a hundred times over and be thrilled. Yeah, it's a pretty good movie. Okay. So. The gypsy's forecast would prove her right some years later. One fortune teller predicted, you will get married and you will have many children, but they will all die. Wow. That's ominous. It is. That'd be a hard pill to swallow. Yep. Like if you're like, if you really believe in the gypsies and and what they're telling you, because I know a lot of people believe that gypsies are, they don't tell you the truth. Back then, gypsies was like a big thing. There was actually, um, you know how we have Santa? Yeah. Well, they have a thing called Bafani. Okay. It's an Italian folklore of an old hag riding a broomstick through the air wearing a black shawl and is covered in soot. So it almost reminds me of like just a witch. But 
She's not. It's a gypsy? <laughs> no. She would enter the homes through the chimney, kind of like Santa, right? Yeah. And deliver gifts to good children and coal, garlic, or onions to the bad ones throughout the throughout Italy and on January 5th in search of baby Jesus. So sometimes, I don't know, at that time, you almost want the garlic and onions because it's like, it's food. <laughs> right? True enough. Point taken. Yeah, I'd probably almost take the food over anything. It's like, besides the coal, you have like the trinity of food, right? There's nothing wrong with coal either. It helps your fire. It does. So, uh, yeah. How is that bad? All they need now is some, what, ginger. The holy trinity of... Um, Borscht. Thai cooking. Okay. No idea. <laughs> it was Italy's version of Santa Claus and perhaps a witch rolled into one. Yeah. And a lot of people believed in this. I've actually never heard of this. I didn't either. Not until I read this. The only thing I've Bofani. heard about. Bofani. Bofani. Yeah. The only thing that I've really heard about as a, a Christmas one that goes bad is Krampus. Oh, yeah. Krampus. Yeah. Or there's also the one from The Office. I forgot the name of that one. Uh, I think its name was Bell's Nickel. <laughs> yep. Something like that. <laughs> the Office Christmas. And wait. Yeah, it was like the German <laughs> Belch Nickel. That's, yes. <laughs> That's kind of what I know about, like, the bad Christmas ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, moving on with the story. <laughs> yep. I'm completely Since we've already her. talked about Stephen King and now The Office. Yeah. Okay, well... You like to throw in, oh, at this eight or this year or whatever movies yeah. going on. So you got that in. Okay. Yep. Okay. In 1917, at the age of 23, going against her mother's wishes, Leonarda married an older man, Raphael Pansardi. I think it's Pansardi. Pansardi. He was a clerk in the registry office who she met in Montella. Montella Pansardi. Let's go get my Italian accents out there. I'd like to put a disclaimer out there. I am so sorry to all the Italians. I'm I, not married to him yet, and I profusely apologize. Actually, I thought that sounded good. No? When you try throwing in the Italian accent. Yeah, pizzati. <laughs> Again, I'm sorry. So, anyways, <laughs> she was always more interested in older men. I think... It could be she felt like she wanted to be nurtured because she never got that in her childhood. That was just my take on it. I don't know her reasons. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. And besides, she always thought the boys were silly, which, you know what? Sometimes they grow into men and they are still silly. Don't talk about me that way. I was just going to say, I'm sorry, Italians. <laughs> <laughs> Her mother actually already picked out a future husband for her daughter. Her cousin. Oh, it wasn't first. I'm, I'm not sure. But back then, it was quite normal. Was it now? Yeah, I actually have a cousin that married a cousin. Uh, I guess they were do. like kissing cousins. They're divorced. Yeah, there's got to be a reason for why she would want to marry her cousin. Like her mother would force her to marry her cousin. Well, yeah, it was uh, the best suitor and financial gain so it was all about her mother's benefit not yeah. her daughter her mother actually wanted the money from the man and when she found out her daughter was marrying someone else her plans were completely destroyed oh 100 percent. so she was so mad at her daughter for ruining her plans amelia placed a curse on her daughter so first off she had a fortune teller giving her the future of multiple births and multiple deaths. And now her own mother has cursed her. You know, put that, mm -hmm. that juju. Yeah. I put a spell on you because you're mine. No. Okay. <laughs> I'll stop. Please. CCR. Okay. I think that even me being as a non-believer, I would start to question my future and more so for my children. Or my future children. Yeah. I would be a little more skeptical. Leonardo, being superstitious, strongly believed that her mother had cursed their marriage. Because shortly after the wedding, the couple had a baby girl. But she died of Spanish flu. So Spanish flu is probably like this year's COVID. 
It was an epidemic that killed millions of people worldwide between 1918 and 1919 a year. Yeah. At least that one only lasted a year and like COVID. Oh, don't get started about that. I know. In 1921, Leonarda and her husband moved to Loria, a town and commune which is in modern times located in the province of Potenza. I'm sure that the Italians that are listening to this, they're even confused on where these towns are that I am naming off because I am probably mispronouncing every one of them. And this is why you have to say the town's names in Italian. (laughs) Potenza. No, this is why you wanted to do a recording of Google Translate on certain words and then dub them in. (laughs) Yeah, that'd be a lot better than going Potenza. No. That would be ridiculous. (laughs) Oh my gosh, that would make our life so much easier, but ridiculous nonetheless. You don't like my accents? No, I don't. Hmm. <laughs> curiouser and curiouser. So, Leonardo and her husband had financial trouble right from the beginning. Pensardi, with his meager earnings, could not support their growing family as soon as they started to have children. Leonardo, she also worked. In 1920, the province of Regino Emilia like most of Italy, experienced tension between fascist and anti-fascist. Life carried on with its normal routines of work and raising families. It was part of the fascist mindset that a good fascist woman should bear as many children as possible. It's like you eat the bonbons with your robe on, feed up, pop out kids, while the husband goes off to war. Yeah. (laughs) When will my husband come back for more? This is the this is the end of World War One too. Nineteen seventeen was I think was the end of World War One. Very true. Something like that. I don't know the exact year. So fascists banned all literature on birth control and increased penalties for abortion, declaring both crime against the state. In nineteen thirty three, there was a celebration of motherhood at the Palazzo Venezia, where a crowd of mothers were blessed by Mussolini. The target was for families to have at least five children, and if they did, they were rewarded. What were they rewarded? About $515. That's a lot of money. Back then? A yeah, ton of money. It is. In 1927, Leonardo was arrested for fraud. When she was released from jail, the couple relocated to Lacedonia? Lacedonia. Lacedonia, province of Avellino, two hours north of Potenza. You need some more accents in these words. Lacedonia, province of Avellino, north of Potenza. There you go. See, that sounds better. Rolls I had to do tongue. the finger too, yeah, right? Rolls off your uh, well, I have some French in me, so the, the hand des- gestures help. Yeah. Uh, just another little disclaimer. Our cats are around again. So if you hear me out here and there, yeah, sorry. Yeah, the driving is bonkers, but what can you do? So their home was destroyed on July 23rd, 1930. By an earthquake that was 6.6 magnitude, and it covered 2,400 square miles, killing 1,404 people and injuring between 4,624 people to 7,000 people. Wow. The exact numbers are not available. That's a 6.6 earthquake? That's a pretty big earthquake. Oh, it's gigantic. Yep. So I'm guessing that that size, it probably should have killed a lot more people, but... You would think it would, but back then, they don't know exact numbers, right? So They didn't have a census, I don't think, back then. I don't think so. So after losing their home, they moved once more to Correggio Regino Emilia, a population of 20,000 people at the time, and the second largest town in the province. Leonardo was a fervent fascist... And altogether, she got pregnant 17 times. She miscarried three times and lost 10 additional children, all before their 10th birthday. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. In the end, she only had four children left, three boys and one girl. Now, because of this, Leonardo was an overprotective mother from losing 13 children, which is quite understandable. 
She would do anything for them to keep them safe. And I mean anything. Raphael managed to find a job at a registry office and Leonarda rolled up her sleeves too. She started to own her own business, a shop which she ran from home. Soon they can afford a spacious apartment. Leonarda was very popular and well-respected in her neighborhood. People actually considered her nice, gentle woman and doting mother to her children. While the idea of being cursed by your mother seems preposterous, Leonarda believed her mother did just that. Once again, she visited another gypsy, who this time told her, quote, In your right hand, I see prison. In your left hand, a criminal asylum. Wow, that's daunting to hear that, mm-hmm. eh? Can't she get some good news? Yeah, I know. Maybe she actually brought this on herself. You know, you're you're told something, so you act on it and bring that to light. Yeah, you believe in it so much. Yeah, that it actually happens. Yeah, exactly. So again, being extremely superstitious, she took these warnings very much to heart. She had already been arrested, so that fate was true. Now, would she be arrested again? Already the first fortune teller had predicted her children would die. And unfortunately, she was right, and they were all dying. Now, at this point, for me being a non-believer again, so at this point, wouldn't you even start to believe this fortune teller? Yeah, 100%. I would totally think that they're being true, because if they said I was going to lose a bunch of children, and, and I happened? lost children, then 100% I would start believing them. And that you were arrested, and you were arrested? Yeah, I'd definitely. It'd start being a believer for sure. I'd be watching my back thinking... Maybe I'm going to be arrested again. Maybe I shouldn't mess up. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Now, as a mother myself, I would do anything to protect my child. And since everything was coming true, she believed that her other children might die. So she was willing to do anything to protect them. And I mean anything. So at her shop, Leonardo sold soaps, perfumes, and cakes. They were always fresh pastries and coffee offered, and Leonardo was obsessed with baking. This is where things take a twist. The shop was always filled with women and chattering and talking, gossiping. Yeah, it almost reminds you of the view. <laughs> the view. Chop, 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 chirp, 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 chirp. And everybody enjoyed her cakes. She hardly left her shop as her shop and her home were the same place, so everyone congregated there. People actually flocked to her home, and for the first time, Leonardo felt good. She felt like the curse actually lifted, and she was finally free and safe. So although Leonardo felt free and safe, Raphael did not feel the same at all. His demeanor changed. His once full of life was now closed off. He no longer talks to people. He started drinking excessively and always went to the movies. Oh, yeah. 1920s movies. Perfect. Black and white. No talking? Is there talking in those movies? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Raphael ended up losing his job at the registry. And because of the Great Depression, jobs were very hard to come by. Leonardo got tired of his presence around and kicked him out. No one ever saw him again. Just gone. Okay, that sounds a little weird. Yeah, he's just gone. Now, did he leave town, the country, or something else happened to him? Oh, this sounds a little bit ominous. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to have one guess what happened. <laughs> okay, proceed. Uh, proceed. One of those tragic moments after losing a child, she remembered some thoughts. Quote, I can't bear the loss of another child. Almost every night, I dream of the little white coffins of those others, swallowed one after the other by the black earth. That's why I studied magic. I read books that talk about palmistry, astronomy, spells, bills, and spiritism. I wanted to learn everything about spells to be able to neutralize them. Leonardo was so obsessed with fortune telling, she decided to take up the practice herself to help the women in the neighborhood with their questions about their future. 
She spoke with passion and became very trusted in the community. No one would ever think that she could do anything wrong. Often they would visit her and have a cup of coffee or a glass of wine while Leonardo did tarot readings or practiced palmistry. It was common practice for housewives to make homemade soaps and candles to make ends meet with such limited means. Yeah, that stuff's easy to make. We used to make candles, so we, we did. Know. <laughs> and I thought about making soaps. I wanted to. Yeah. So we yeah we make candles. It was kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Soaps was made by boiling pork bones and cartilage in caustic soda. That's not how I googled it. Different times. Different times. I was not going to go that route. It was best to do this outdoors, as the smell was so overpowering. Leonardo had a big pot on her stove indoors which she used to make her soap. Nazi Germany, under Adolf Hitler's rule, invaded Poland in 1939. World War II had begun. You were just talking about that. Yep, I was. Italy, led by Mussolini, was looking to enter the war on the side of Germany and had begun recruiting for their military. And Giuseppe Pansardi, Leonardo's son, elder son, had been designated to be part of the Italian army. Like his name. Giuseppe Giuseppe Pensati. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry, I do. The handsome, olive-skinned, and dark-eyed Giuseppe was her unashamedly favorite child. She would do anything for his safety. One night, Leonardo had a dream. A Madonna holding a child in her arms came to her. Some say Leonardo thought it was her mother coming to her dreams. There was Madonna, who wanted Leonardo to sacrifice innocent human lives in exchange for her children. So that's usually what happens. People see spirits or visions in their dreams, Mm -hmm. and they decide to act on it for sure. Let me know if you uh, see anything in your dreams, and I need to go, you know, stay at a hotel. I don't have dreams. You do. You just don't remember them. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so Leonardo had already lost 13 of her 17 children. Wow. Mm-hmm. The prophecy she was given had been true. It's hard to say what a person would do in that situation. I think I would do anything. If I knew that something would save my child and this prophecy, you know, Madonna came and told me I had to take a life to save a life. I think I would do it. Yeah. Anything to save my children. I definitely would. Mm -hmm. So determined to protect her child at all costs, Leonardo decided the only way to do it was by human sacrifice, like her dreams told her. To be safe, she needed to sacrifice four people in order to save all four of her children. Her daughter, Norma, still attended the nun's kindergarten. The two youngest males, Bernardo and... Biagio sure. were conscripts and high school students, respectively. Leonardo found her victims in three middle aged women, all neighbors. Wow. I don't want to be her neighbor. Nope. Some sources say that these women all visited her for help. Others state merely that they were friends and seeking advice. Probably get their palms red or something like that. Mm hmm. Just, or just going for coffee, you yeah. know? Special coffee. Special wine. Yeah. Leonardo decided to tell the woman whatever they wanted to hear to make them feel vulnerable, to get them to do whatever she wanted them to do. She became a master manipulator to these women. And in that, she would be able to take all their money and sacrifice their bodies in exchange to protect her own blood. Whatever the reason, Leonardo began to plan the deaths of the three women. In her mind, the only way to keep her children alive, especially Giuseppe, her firstborn, was Faustina Setti, a lifelong spinster who asked Leonardo for help in finding a husband. Leonardo told her a suitable partner in Pola, modern-day Croatia, but asked her to tell no one of the news. She also persuaded Seti to write letters and postcards to relatives and friends. They were to be mailed when she reached Pola to tell them that everything was fine. 
Seti came to visit Leonarda one last time before she left for Pola. Leonarda drugged her wine that she was drinking. Falling unconscious, Leonarda killed Faustino with an axe and then dragged her body to a closet and cut her into nine parts, gathering her blood in a basin. Leonarda described what happened next in her official statement. Quote, I threw the pieces in a pot, added seven kilos of caustic soda, which I had bought to make soap, and stirred the mixture until the pieces dissolved into a thick, dark mush that I poured into several buckets and emptied into a septic tank. As for the blood in the basin, I waited until it had coagulated, dried in the oven, ground it, mixed it with flour, sugar, chocolate, milk, and eggs, as well as a bit of margarine, kneading all the ingredients together. I made a lot of crunchy tea cakes and served them to the ladies who came to visit, though Giuseppe and I also ate them. That is utterly disgusting. Uh Uh-huh. That's a special cake I do (laughs) not want a piece of. (laughs) Nope. And I like me some cake. (laughs) So now your picture of the Italian over the stove, you know, making her spaghetti. What are you thinking now? Not good. (laughs) Do you want some of that? No. (laughs) No. That does not sound appealing to me. (laughs) No. Some sources also record that Leonardo apparently received Seti's life savings of $2,811 Canadian. Since it only takes three hours at 300 degrees to dissolve a body, the process of it all was fairly quick and the fumes were intolerable. Three hours at 300 degrees? That's a stat I didn't want to know. It's a quick process. With Leonardo's second victim, a middle-aged Francesca Seovi, she claimed to have found a job for her in modern-day northern Italy. So just like what Seti was told to do, Francesca was told the same thing, to send postcards to friends, but this time from Corridio, detailing her plans. When the plan was in place on September 5th, 1940, Seovi went to visit Leonardo to say goodbye, just as Seti did. Given the drugged wine once again, Leonardo used the same axe killing her friend, Leonardo was able to get 281 Canadian dollars. Such a small, well, I guess in that time it's probably a whole lot more for inflation, but I mean, it seems like a, lot, a small amount of money to kill somebody for. It is. Like the first one, she got $2,800. Yeah. And now it's what? A drastic drop. Yeah, 281. Yep. Crazy. On September 30th, 1940, Leonardo's final victim was 53 year old Virginia Cassiopo. Virginia was a former soprano singer who sang at La Scala, a famous opera house in Milan. Virginia was told Leonardo had found her a job in Florence. As with the other two women, she was told not to tell a soul where she was going. On the night of her disappearance, before she left for Florence, she agreed to go visit Leonardo first. Like the other two victims, Virginia's body was melted into making soap. According to Leonardo's statement, quote, She ended up in the pot, like the other two. Her flesh was fat and white. When it had melted, I added a bottle of cologne, and after a long time on the boil, I was able to make some most acceptable creamy soap. I gave bars to neighbors and acquaintances. The cakes, too, were better. The woman was really sweet. Oh, that is really gross. <laughs> no. From Virginia, Leonardo actually reportedly received 50,000 lire, assorted jewels, and public bonds. So how much was that 50,000 lire? It was about $4,700 Canadian. Today. Today. That's crazy because that's a lot of money for back then. You think about that back then, yeah. Yeah, inflation is huge. Mm -hmm. Leonardo had always thought that the people she killed would not be missed, but that was not the case for Virginia. Concerned about her dead brother's wife's disappearance, Albertina Fanti went in search of her sister-in-law as they were always known to watch out for each other. Unlike the other two, Virginia actually told Albertina about the prospect of a job in Florence. Virginia was reliving the glory days when she was a singer. 
Albertina thought everything was too good to be true, especially if she thought that she had a chance to be back on stage being in her 50s. Virginia's sister-in-law, Albertina Fanti, grew suspicious of her sudden disappearance and had last seen her entering Leonardo's house. She reported her fears to the superintendent of police in Reggio Emilia, who then opened an investigation. In the home, they found a hammer, hacksaw, kitchen knife, axes, and hatchet, and so they arrested her. Initially, Leonardo denied killing anyone. Who would believe an elderly, short, large woman could have done all this and be guilty of a triple murder? Leonardo did not confess to the murders. However, after Giuseppe was implicated in Virginia's murder, Leonardo gave a full confession. In 1946, her trial was conducted in Reggio Emilia. She confessed to the murders, providing detailed accounts of what she had done to save her son from any blame. Based on her confession, one can surmise that Leonardo felt an element of pride for her actions. So I'm guessing that pride would probably come from a god complex or something? I would say so. Leonardo, intent on defending him with all her strength, proposed a demonstration to make it clear that she was the only perpetrator of the slaughter. In front of the magistrates and lawyers, in just 12 minutes, Leonardo dissected the corpse of a vagabond who died in the hospital and proceeded with a soaping technique. That's weird how that's, they would make her demonstrate it back <laughs> in the day. Like, that would never happen now. Prove it. Like, prove it. Yeah, it's like, prove it. <laughs> Here's a dead body. Prove it. Yeah, that's... That's dumbfounding me right <laughs> it's now. so disgusting and odd. <laughs> I'm sure the person that died didn't expect their body was going to go through that. No, exactly. <laughs> oh. So to lighten up the mood just a little bit after talking about the poor vagabond, here's a fun fact. Did you know that mug shots were invented in 1840? and began to be standardized, practiced by French police officer and biometric researcher Alphonse Bertillon in 1888? No, I did not. Neither did I. Just wanted to throw something fun out there. Some learning. Yeah, looking up in this killer is... This little fun fact came up, so I thought I'd just add it. When you look at her picture, who would think that this sweet Italian woman would, you know, who's making a ton of pasta for her family, would turn out to be this killer, soap maker, boiling people. Um, after reading up on her and doing all this research, I think I would go hungry if she made me anything. Oh, yeah, 100% for sure. <laughs> I'll eat the bugs outside. Leonardo was tried for murder in Reggio Emilia on June 12th, 1946. Leonardo remained unrepentant, going as far as to correct the official account while on the stand. Gripping the witness stand rail with oddly delicate hands and calmly set the prosecutor right on certain details, her deep-set dark eyes gleamed with a wild inner pride as she concluded, quote, I gave the copper ladle, which I used to skin the fat off the kettle, to my country which was so badly in need of metal during the last days of the war. Leonardo, cannibal, and the first female serial killer in Italy, who was also infamous in for turning her victims into soaps and tea cakes between 1939 and 1940, was found guilty on all three counts of the atrocious murders of Faustina Setti, Francesca Sovi, and Virginia Cassiopo and sentenced to the 30 years of prison and three years in a criminal asylum. In prison, she wrote, crocheted, and baked cookies that no one wanted to taste. Yeah, who would, right? No. You're allowed to bake cookies in prison? Apparently, yeah. back then. Okay. She also received regular visits from her children. Leonardo died at 76 years of age of cerebral apoplexy, similar to a stroke in the Women's Criminal Asylum in Pozzuoli, near Naples, on October 15, 1970. A number of artifacts from the case, including the pot in which the victims were boiled, are on display at the Criminal Museum in Rome. 
When I looked into it further, I did find that her son Giuseppe did survive in the war after all. On the German side? (laughs) Surprising. Maybe, you know, her killing the people worked. Yeah, maybe. Leonardo's life was summarized by tales of great psychological trauma and superstition. When we think of superstition now, we think of breaking a mirror, walking under a ladder, or the black cat passing in front of us, you know, bringing us the seven years of bad luck, and or sports wearing the same jersey, you don't, you can't wash it. We, everyone's got those superstitions. Yep. And she truly believed in all of this, just as well as the person who wears that sweaty jersey and... If they wash it, their team will lose. Oh, yeah. That's all the time. Or the players that won't shave. Leonarda, on the other hand, thought that she was destined to have all her children die based on the theory a mother cursed her with. She had a strong belief she had to do whatever it took to keep her children alive. So she decided to turn the cosmic tables around and took control of fate of her children. Now, would you do the same? If I was superstitious and believed in that kind of stuff, I would definitely do the same. Well, not just superstition. Like, things were happening. If you lost 13 or 17 children because a gypsy told you. And your mother cursed you. And your mother cursed you, then I would definitely take that seriously. I would. I completely would. So that is it for Leonardo Cincilio and my case I was able to look into. Yeah, it's a really good case. I'd never heard of this one before. And having like an older case about cannibalism um, with a mother yeah. feeding people to her children, her neighbors. Yeah, she killing these people and then feeding them off to the other neighbors and making tea cakes and with making them. soap from it. Like, it reminds mm. me of like Fight Club when they're like taking the bodies and making soap out of it. And just imagine that smell because when they were making soap back then, they would do the soap outside. But she didn't want anyone to see what she was doing. So she was having that soap made inside her house on the stove with that toxic smell just enclosing her home. Oh, yeah. 100%. I think it would be really terrible smell back oh, then. That that smell would be into your skin, your clothes, everything in your home. Yeah, that is the enzymes of your body as oh. attached to your, your skin. Yeah. And your hair. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that smell would be atrocious. When I look at her mugshot, you don't picture this murderer. She just looks like this sweet old woman. She looks like this Italian woman. Yeah, just don't eat her food. Don't eat her food. (laughs) Okay, well that's it on this case, this Patreon episode. Mm Mm-hmm. And if you would like to reach out at us, you could contact us at worldstruecrime at hotmail.com. We have a website at www.worldstruecrime.com. Yep. And uh, let us know what you think about this case and other cases that uh, you've heard from us. You bet. We also have uh, Facebook, too. Yeah, Facebook and Instagram mm-hmm. at World's True Crime. Mm-hmm. Um, her, we As wanna... always, I'm always going to say thank you to my daughter every time. My daughter, Sam, who did our cover. Thank you, Sam. Thanks again, Sam. So I'm Denise. I'm Brad. And remember, the world is not always as it seems. You're taking my line. I am. You're taking my job away from me. I know, I am. It's my episode. Okay, goodbye, everyone. (laughs) Bye.